got to start out in prayer. Prayer's where it's at. So let's pray. Oh, Father God, man, we thank you for families and, and, and kids and that we get to have conversations about what children's ministry could look like, to dream, to imagine, to innovate, to seek your heart and, and, and to look to you and say, help us. What does this look like? And how fun is that? Um, I pray this morning that this message um, drawn from your word, um, that it would go to our hearts. I know I'm not the only one kind of coming in a little bit scattered. Um, maybe others are this morning as well. That right now your spirit would just rest our souls, set us at ease so we could focus on you and how awesome you are, that we'd leave here changed, transformed, maybe challenged to be more like your son, to be more like Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so last week we started a series on hope, and we looked at Peter and Jesus, and they're in the middle of a storm, and Jesus is doing his walking on water thing, which is amazing. But we talked about what does it look like to really trust God in the midst of those storms, to have hope, even when it feels like things are falling apart, when things are, are going sideways. And this week, now we're going to look at what hope-filled leadership looks like, what, what hope looks like in the midst of um, leadership. And, and this kind of leadership, and maybe even this message, will be sort of crazy and um, unexpected from what you generally probably picture from leadership. So as you're filling out your, your bulletin there of those qualities of leadership, don't change your answers just because I told you it's going to be unexpected and crazy because now you're going to be putting crazy answers because you were that kid in class that wanted to get all A's to make the teacher happy. Just put what you think good qualities of leadership are. And um, we're going to be starting with Nehemiah. We're going to be looking at Nehemiah. And um, any of you familiar with Nehemiah? Some are, some aren't familiar with Nehemiah. I literally have two hands up, so we're going to have to start working on that because I know about 90% of you are familiar with Nehemiah, and I just want to make sure we're awake, so we'll try it again. Any of you familiar with Nehemiah? So there we go. I literally got 10 hands. All right. That's an improvement. All right. So Nehemiah chronologically is towards the end of the Old Testament, even though as you're flipping there in your Bible to get to Nehemiah, it's, it's towards the middle. And Israel has this history of good kings and, and bad kings. It's tumultuous. And uh, so the kingdom winds up getting divided in two. And if you were wondering how long is it going to take before Nathan gets out a map and his laser pointer, the answer was two weeks. All right, all the nerds excited? Here we go. Map time. All right, divided kingdom. So we have the kingdom of Israel up top here, and uh, that's what we've got there. And all those watching online later on, you don't get to see the laser pointer part. So you can hear me right now, but you can't see the laser pointer. All right, and then we've got the southern kingdom, which is, which is Judah right there, and then you see the capital, which is Jerusalem. You got that? And then the Assyrian Empire is up there. That'll, that'll be important as part of our history here. But one kingdom, and then it's divided. Imagine that, uh, division in politics. Such a crazy idea. That's what was going on then. That never happens today. So you have the northern kingdom, Israel, southern kingdom, Judah. And the Assyrians wind up conquering the northern kingdom. The Babylonians wind up conquering the southern kingdom, they wind up destroying the city, they destroy the walls, they destroy the temple, they annihilate and wipe it all out, destroy everything that they knew within Jerusalem. Bad, bad, bad thing. And Israelites are scattered, so we have a map of them being scattered and where they got scattered to. Boy, that one's really fuzzy, so not the best resolution map for the guy that picked that map, um, which was me. All right, so um, from Jerusalem and Judah down here, you can see from this really fuzzy red line all the way over here to Babylon. And we get much of the Old Testament about them being in, in exile and the Israelites are scattered. And so you have King Xerxes and, and the Babylonians 
who have just scattered the Jews, but then he allows them to come back to Jerusalem to start to rebuild. Remember, everything's been wiped out. So he invites them to come back. And so you have the book of Ezra in your Old Testament, which is about them rebuilding the temple. And then you've got the book of Nehemiah, which is about them rebuilding Jerusalem. Our history lesson's almost over. So for any of you starting to fall asleep at the beginning of the message, we're almost done. You've made it this far. We're almost there. Okay. So what do we know about Nehemiah? He wasn't a, a, a king, um, not a prophet, wasn't a priest. Um, he was just a normal guy who was a cupbearer to the king. So you're wondering what a cupbearer is. It meant he got to select the wine and drink the wine of the king. So if you're a fan of wine, this would be your dream job. You're hearing that and you're going, cupbearer, where's that online? I need to, I need to look that one up. Here's the downside, though. The cupbearer had to drink the wine before the king because people were trying to do what to the king? Poison him. Assassinate him. So it's not actually that fun of a dream job after all. That's what, that's what Nehemiah was doing as the cupbearer there. So not a paid professional. We've got that. Just a, a normal guy. Didn't go to seminary. A guy with a job. The book is his personal journal. Now that they're back in Jerusalem, given permission to rebuild things. All right? So we have thousands of books about leadership, a whole lot of books about leadership, but he does something that not many would describe about leadership. You and Nehemiah in your Bible? All right, thank you to the one person that said yes. All right, we'll put it on the screen. Verse 3, I just feel like it's okay to be active, to engage, to say yes, and that's why I'm going to keep doing that because I like a vivacious, crazy crowd, and we'll get there, we'll get there. I have to start paying you money so that it seems like we're excited to be here. All right, verse 3, verse 3. They said to me, those who survive, survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. So here are the people, they're coming back. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. In ancient times, if you didn't have your walls and your gates... Well, that was bad because anyone was going to come in and just pillage. And, and so that's the state Jerusalem's finding itself as they're coming back. Verse 4, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So he's devastated. He's heartbroken. This is the state of Jerusalem. Prayed, fasted. And he wept, the context we get from chapter 2 is that he did this for four months before he goes to the king. He's known for bold leadership. That's Nehemiah, anyone who knows about Nehemiah. Bold leader, and we'll get to some of that in a minute. But his starting point is praying, fasting, and a whole lot of weeping. Step one, weep. Chapter 2, he gets permission from King Xerxes to, to start rebuilding and they rebuild the walls after 140 years. Been kicked out, exiled, 140 years have been wiped out. Are you with me on that? So when he's weeping and crying and brokenhearted about the state of Jerusalem, how many years had it been since Jerusalem was destroyed? 140 years. That's sort of like pick someone from the late 1800s that was I guess Abraham Lincoln oh my and you start weeping and crying and everyone here would just what's wrong with that guy that's really old news Nathan we've moved on it, that was a long time ago right you can imagine that's Nehemiah is crying over something that's 140 years ago you're weeping about it my guess is What's happening here with Nehemiah is that he got a new heart. A new heart. I mean, think about it. Now he's got this heart that's like Jesus, I think, for the city, for Jerusalem, and seeing what has happened and going, this isn't right. This is not what God intended. And, and just, I'm not going to be able to do that with this microphone here. I'm used to having this. 
So I'll try to stop doing that, because that's going to get annoying fast. And I think history shows us that we get used to things. We get apathetic. When things are the way they are, then it's just normal. That's the way it is. And yet great leaders have their finger on the pulse where you'd say, this is broken, and they're moved by it. This isn't right, and they're moved by it. Even in the midst of sort of, here's the status quo, they put their finger on the pulse and say, this isn't right. And then they have a vision of the future to be able to say, this is what it could look like to rebuild, to restore, to heal, to have something new pop up. So why is Nehemiah's story important to us? Why does that matter to us here at Rhythm? We're in a city and we're in surrounding towns where we live, where people are confused, where they're anxious, sort of just paycheck to paycheck it may be. People are hurt, people are broken, people are... We know, right? This is the state of things around us. And many of you may come in with some of those sort of just, this is, where, this is where I'm at. And I wonder if we're being honest, if we'd say, are we really troubled by those things that are around us? I mean, like deep down where you'd go, ah. Or is it just sort of, yeah, that's, that's awful. But I'm not, well, in my heart of hearts, I'm not really troubled. And why? Because this is all we've known. It's normal. It may not be 140 years, but for my lifetime, this is the state of things we find ourselves in. It's brokenness. We get accustomed to the brokenness. For them, 140 years, that's what's normal. And yet, Nehemiah stirred by the brokenness. Mother Teresa, what was going on there? Right? India, Calcutta. Why? Because she's moved by that brokenness. Martin Luther King Jr., right? A dream, a way to restore this. But why? Because he was moved by brokenness. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, another one in Germany where he could have cut bait and run well before things hit the fan, by the way. A brilliant theologian, a great Christian, wound up losing his life, but he decided to stay because of the brokenness. Moved by that brokenness. Do we think of great leaders as people who are moved by brokenness? So maybe just ask yourself, and just be honest, how do you, how do you respond to brokenness? Maybe there's sort of multiple... Are, are you numb to it? Do you just complain about it? That's another one. It's their own fault. They did it to themselves. Uh, I think one reason it's difficult is because we're inundated. It's just the news and the violence or the drug use or whatever your thing is that you think is wrong with our society. And then we just, the news, and we just kind of shut down because we're just... I just want to get my kids to soccer this week and groceries and I got to work and now you've got to put this on the news. Please time out, right? Or some of you there too where it's just, good grief. I don't have the bandwidth to just, it's enough. Some people are cynical. Oof. Some of us just ignore it. I see brokenness in our city. I see it in our towns. I think you do too. We, we see it. I see it here at Rhythm Church. Always one of the awesome things about Rhythm Church is there are people coming in who are broken, and because we were vulnerable, they were allowed to be vulnerable with their brokenness so that Jesus could restore them, heal them, and rebuild them. Last week, I was pretty vulnerable about my mental health that actually one of the big reasons we moved to New Zealand was my mental health I was vulnerable about it at the time with you guys, but you didn't know the extent of it. It was really bad. <laughs> I'll just say that it was really bad. And so I, I shared that last week, and then I got a message this week from someone in church, and um, he's been in the, the Marines, and so has dealt with a whole host of issues from that, with the VA, you know, therapist trying to work through probably PTSD and, and traumas and things. And he shared how 
it, it, simply because God somehow working through those words of me being vulnerable hit him in a way where it moved him to tears. Where he's just like, work is slamming me and I'm stressed out. But I haven't had a drink in a week. And for the first time this week, I opened my Bible. And I only do that at church, but I haven't opened my Bible in years. And I found my, myself praying this week. And I, and I just thought, that's, that's brokenness. But for us to be able to surround one another and just say, yeah, yeah, I've been there too. And I know what that's like. And by the way, I'll just add another thing that's unique about Rhythm Church is I'm Anabaptist in my theology about the military, church and state on that particular issue. Mennonites, Quakers, you know, that just means I believe in nonviolence. I believe Jesus calls us to be peaceful and nonviolent. But the beauty of that is I want lots and lots of military people in our church because my take on Romans 13 is not every Christian's take, and we need Christians in the military, and having servicemen here or policemen here is awesome because we may not agree about Romans 13, but who cares? We have unity in Christ, and we can hug each other around our brokenness or a hundred other issues that we do have in common. Someone's back there going, oh, he's just one of those peace guys. No, I just that's where Jesus is at for me. I could be wrong. I love the military, man. I want them all here, all the branches. My dad was in the Navy. Grandpa's in the Navy. Love you guys. You guys are incredible. And like, absolutely. Like, when you, you leave America for a few years, you come back and love her more than you can imagine. Let me tell you something. Like, I love New Zealand, but America... I won't say it's the greatest because I think you shouldn't get into that sort of thing. America's awesome, and I'm, I mean, so Marine, Navy, or whoever you may be, I'm trying to say, way to go, and if, if you're like my friend I just described, then we want to be here for you too. But his sort of brokenness he described in getting those messages and giving him a hug this morning, that's easy because I can say he's my friend. I mean, there's this sort of brokenness, I remember, where I'm picking someone up from church pretty regularly that's difficult because you walk into the living room and it's, it's sort of like an episode of hoarders, if I'm being honest. And I'm not even sure I can walk through the living room and there's at least maybe 10 cats in here, so there's a distinct odor, right? And if I'm being like super honest, I'd say, man, I want this guy to come to church. I'll do whatever, so I'm picking you up but he lives with his mom and has struggled through stuff. And I remember picking him up and just th there's that, it's, it can be tough at times because we just, maybe that's, this is uncomfortable. Like I'm not Mother Teresa then. Are you with me? I'm just being honest to say like some brokenness, we can enter in and go, I'm with you. Then others, we, we don't always, it's tough. And I think we kind of look at that scenario and that's what we think of as a brokenness in America because we've made an idol of wealth. So people in poverty, well, that's where you're going to find the neighborhoods that are broken. And that's such an absurd sort of notion that we do in our churches, by the way, too. I've worked in white-collar America. Guess what? Just as broken and hurting and lonely. There's a brokenness there. It's brokenness all around us. Now look what Psalm 34 says. Psalm 34 says this. The Lord is close to who? The brokenhearted. That's me. And if you're being honest, you've found times in your life where you've been in that place where you're broken. It may not be this morning, and that's awesome. We rejoice with those who rejoice but sometimes we're not there. Put that slide back up. A church, look at that bottom statement there. A church should see itself joining with Jesus, restoring, rebuilding, and healing the brokenhearted. That's one of the things the church does. Say, how can we enter in? How do we, how do we serve, love, restore, whatever it may be? That's what a church is here for. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Uh, uh, awesome, awesome. So back to Nehemiah. This is the state of Jerusalem, 450 B.C., 450 years before Jesus. No wall, no temple, no anything. This great leader sits down to cry for months. 
So leaders are supposed to have vision and inspiration. Liz has a microphone. So on your bulletin, we put that question. Qualities of leadership. Someone, three or four of you, want to just be bold, raise your hand. Liz is going to come down on the microphone. What qualities do you aspire to or what qualities do you see in great leaders? Maybe biblical qualities, we would say, that you look to for leadership. Anyone want to jump in? Do we need to turn out the lights so, so we don't see you? Come on, we know some of you. Just throw, throw out an answer if you don't want a microphone. Discipline, Discipline. great answer. Anybody else? Discipline, really good one. Bold. Bold. Good one, Mark. What's that? Frank? Frank. Strength. 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 Yes. Caring and understanding. Empathy. Humble. Yeah. Humble. Man, oh man. So true. Humble. Anyone else? Honesty. Ooh, you guys are hitting the good ones. Anyone else? No judgment. So non-judgmental. See, that one's a tough one. You put that one on Facebook, and I think leaders need to speak truth. How do you speak truth and clarity without denigrating? Like you're saying, without, yeah, that's a tough one, isn't it? Anyone else? Anyone else? We didn't even need the microphone. We just, we went old school there. Great answers. And we want kids to be able to answer too. So if you've got one of your teenagers or young ones sitting there and she's just like, I got an answer, have her speak up. Because I'm sorry if in the past at Rhythm we felt like kids weren't able to speak up or weren't important or didn't feel important. We're, well, we already talked about that. We're going we're gonna to make that happen. So if you've read leadership books, and I used to read them all the time, because I'm in America, I'm going to lead a church, we're going to grow, we're going to have lots of people, I just, whatever, gosh. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, and the conferences, I can tell you, none of them say, step one, you want to be a leader, weep. <laughs> and then weep some more, and then weep some more, and then weep some more, do it for four months. And now you're going to start to learn what it means to be a leader. It's not how we do things in America. It's not. It's not. Some of us fear our emotions. I, I know that. It's just weakness. Men can't cry. You guys, as soon as you had kids, you know you were just like, something happened with you. And if you're not admitting that, then you're lying right now. You have kids. Man, that, that faucet just starts, what's happening to me? But we process our emotions with God wherever you're at. And that's what Nehemiah was doing. Now, the rest of the book is glamorous and amazing and awesome, and we celebrate, which as Americans, that's what we want to focus on. In our churches, that's what we want to focus on because we're trying to sell Jesus, and he's amazing, so come to our church because it's amazing all the time. So we, we, that's the rest of Nehemiah, and it's less weepy. Is weepy a word? Yeah, weepy's a word. I can say that. Well, it's less weepy, the rest of Nehemiah. So, yay. I mean, let's put it on the screen there. We've got, you know, chapter 3, Nehemiah's organizing teams, the family. They're going to they're gonna rebuild the walls. This is going to be awesome. they got the 10 gates. And we've got a picture of a map. Last one, I promise. But this is what it's going to look like when Nehemiah's done. You, you've got the gates. I mean, and, and there's one called the Dung Gate. I can't help but always point it out just because I think... Well, that's awesome. And the East Gate, the East Gate, listen, about the East Gate, this is where Jesus in the triumphal entry comes in. We have a picture of what it looks like now. Liz has been to Israel. Will, did you go to Israel at some point? Never did. Okay, I thought you might have. But if you've been to Israel, the history is incredible. The, the, the places where Jesus walked, and that's where he would have entered on the East Gate. Let's go back to our slide with, with Nehemiah there. Chapter 4, the enemies start to come in and threaten because the enemies are seeing they're rebuilding the walls. This is not good. He gathers the people. They're not backing down. That's where you do need the military sort of people that are not like me to do your fight, right? So Nehemiah's got the trowel in one hand because he's building walls. The trowel, did I say that right? I've never actually built a wall. I think it's a, tra a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other because he's ready to do battle. We're building this wall. God's called us to do it. No enemy's going to stop us. Chapter 5, uh, some of the rich people 
are taking advantage of the poor. You can read it. It's a chapter about generosity, and boy, does Nehemiah flip his lid and just go, you are missing the heart of God if you think, yeah. Anyway, chapter chapter 6, more opposition uh, to kill him. They, he winds up outsmarting him. But let's put this verse on the screen. Um, we'll read it from chapter 6. Verse 15, so the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. Huge wall. You saw that map. He gathers everyone together and does it in 52 days, which is insane. The cupbearer able to rebuild and do this effort. 52 days. Ancient version of extreme home makeover. What's that show called? Extreme Makeover Home Edition, right? Ty Pennington. They didn't have buses then, but that would have been the time. You, you, everybody's excited, and he's standing in front, and they start chanting. Okay, we'll try that again. And they start chanting, move that bus. All right, all right. Yes, that was it. And the people of Israel would have said, the bus has moved, and there are the walls. Incredible. 52 days. Are you kidding? Awesome. And then Revival. Revival is taking place. What, let's see. Like, go back to the slide. Do we have chapter in 7 and 8? Did I put that up there? Oh, I did. So the exiles, they all return. Because if we have walls, that means we're what? Safe, protected. It's 40,000 people. Can you imagine the celebration? We've been in exile for 140 years. Now they're tears of joy. We celebrate. Chapter 8, Ezra, he's the priest. Now he's starting to teach him. These are the laws of God. These are the ways of our people. We need to get back to that because we've been off with the pagans. It's revival because of Nehemiah. But if chapter 1 doesn't happen, where it's the praying, the fasting, and the weeping, then none of the other stuff happens. Something I don't want to pass up back in chapter 1. We can't overlook this. This is so important when we're talking about rebuilding, restoring, healing, reaching brokenness. This is so important. We can't overlook this. Chapter 1, verse 5. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. Notice this. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Confess his sin. Church, I'll just speak for us. We can't just be, well, the sin, it's out there where the sinners are at. Or the brokenness, it's out there. The key to being moved by brokenness is going, there's, broken, I gotta stop. there's brokenness in here. That's the key to being moved by it. Key to being moved by seeing what others may be struggling with in their sins is knowing I am a sinner and I need Jesus Christ and the work of his cross. And later on, Nehemiah 9 after the wall even gets built, they're having a revival. Again, they repent, confess their, their sin. They do, it, they do it again. You can look it up. We have sinned, the we part. It's very important. We. And that pattern happens again and again and again in the Old Testament as there's just this ebb and flow of revival and then crashing and burning and revival. And Daniel 9, I, I have sinned. Uh, or Isaiah, yeah, Daniel 9, we have sinned. Yeah, Isaiah 6. I should have wrote these down. Um, I'm unclean. The book of Ezra, which is part of our story, he's, he's confessing to God and saying, our iniquities have built up our iniquities. He's saying, I am unshamed. And churches are really good at saying what they have done or what they are doing, what horrible sinners they are. And sin is all around us, and that is true. And in the context of a relationship you have 
with someone who knows you and trusts you and, and, and they know you love them and you've entered in their brokenness, then there are times and places to talk about their sin. Absolutely, because we want them freed from those chains. Don't go up to random strangers and talk about their sins. Do you think that ever works? Ever, church. The key is starting with our sin, and when you've seen our own brokenness and our sin in light of God's holiness, it's so much easier to enter into others' lives without thinking you're above them or better than them or more holy than them. Nehemiah is not even mentioned in the New Testament. This is crazy to me. But he foreshadows Jesus. Have you noticed the parallels? Have you guys noticed this as we read the story? The cupbearer moves from which hand of the king? Which hand do you think he was on as cupbearer? Left or right? Left is not the right answer. So it's right. So he's always at the right hand of the king and leaves the right hand of the king to go to the people. Jesus leaves the right hand of the father to come into a broken world. It's like Nehemiah. To rebuild, to restore. Nehemiah wept and prayed for Jerusalem. Jesus wept and prayed for Jerusalem. Nehemiah faced all kinds of trials. Read the book. It's not a very long book. Read it this week. All kinds of trials. Jesus, I mean, good grief. We want to sell Christianity where you just hashtag blessed all the time. I'm like, well, don't read the New Testament because they're all dying and being martyred and suffering. And Jesus was right at the top of that list. Suffering for us. Put on trial for us. Put on the cross for us. Hardships for us. Nehemiah took on the sins of the people. We just read that passage. He's saying, we have sinned. He could have said, they were the ones that blew it the last 140 years, right? He didn't do that. We have sinned. And Jesus literally took on our sins, humanity's sins. And then Nehemiah, the return to rebuilding the walls, and Jesus is going to someday return and rebuild and restore a new heavens and new earth. It's going to be awesome, by the way. Amen. Amen. Anybody heard of uh, Father, Father um, Gregory Boyle? Uh, Tattoos on the Heart is a book he's written. Maybe. Okay, other than Liz, maybe. Any? So this is exciting. Oh, Judy has. Yay, all right. There's, I'm so excited to someone else. But um, yeah, he's a, a priest in, in Los Angeles. And um, we can put some pictures up of him. And um, he's the white guy with the beard. So there you go, as far as the very good, um, awesome priest. And so in 1988, he found him, his parish and ministry. And um, kids were getting kicked out of school, middle school, high school delinquency, these sort of things. So guess who were recruiting those students? Gangs. Yeah, gangs. So he found this to be a huge problem. So he said, if I start an at-risk sort of school, will you come to my school? So he started getting these kids off the street to school. Riots happened in 1992. So he starts Homeboy Industries. He wanted to start to get those teenagers he was seeing that were going to prison, that were then coming out, who were struggling to get jobs. I'm going to give them jobs. So Homeboy bakery was the first one that started but you're gonna bake bread you're gonna we're a business and i'm gonna give you a job so you can make money and not have that cycle of of you know sort of violence and backlog and violence because it's really hard to get a job once you've done certain things started doing tattoo removal because also you have those sort of tattoos the gang ones no one's gonna hire you and this is what this father started doing in 1992. Well, Homeboy Industries has now turned into this gigantic thing serving the inner city. Thousands of gang members who have gotten clean and sober. He does counseling. He's entering the brokenness. He's entering into the brokenness. Now look at this quote. This is so profound. Look at this quote by him and what he says. It seems kinship. Kinship's really big for him. What does that mean, kinship? Kinship is not serving the other, but being one with the other. Ooh. Jesus was not a man for others. He was one with them. There's a world of difference in that. Jesus didn't seek the rights, the lepers. 
he touched the leper before he got around to curing them. That was Jesus. When Father Boyle knew, Jesus entered into our brokenness when he was on earth. And now he expects Jesus to do the same because when God still wants to enter into the brokenness, it's the Holy Spirit within us, through us, to enter into a broken world. And God is going to rebuild Rhythm Church. Amen. I mean, I, like Satan took his best shot over the last three or four years. I'm getting emotional right now. COVID, COVID hurt a lot of churches. There are other circumstances here or whatever over the last three or four years. Some of you know, some of you are like, what's going on? Well, don't ask. It's just churches are messy sometimes. And some of you have been through that mess over the last three or four years. And, and so some people have left. And that's tough. That's really tough. Not, not, not because people are leaving and, and we need to be about numbers. I told you, I don't even care about that. They left because they were hurt or wounded, or with COVID, just kind of locked. And it's, there's no pointing fingers. It's we. Well, that was, Liz, and you weren't here. No, no, it's we. It's we as leaders. We have done this. And I hear these stories, and it makes me really emotional because I just, like, I'm sorry. We are sorry. That shouldn't have happened to you. That shouldn't have been said. Or, like, it's, it's brokenness. It's, and some are going to other churches. Man, there's so many awesome churches in town, so that's fine. That's awesome. But because we need to rebuild, it means we need to earn your trust. Some of you have known us for two weeks. Want to earn your trust? Or to say, we are sorry. Or here are the things we're working on. Or if you have questions we're working on, but it's got to start with God doing a work in here, in our hearts, as a church, and saying, God, rebuild our church. God, restore us. Holy Spirit, breathe your life into us as a church. Breathe your crazy, wild, unfettered sort of life in here of joy, of passion, of exuberance, of people coming in and going, I'm loved here no matter what. I'm broken but they care about me no matter what because that's Rhythm Church. God's going to do a work here. And I'm not saying I'm speaking prophetically. I'm, I get kind of nervous about that stuff because I'm not a prophet. But some of you may be, and that's awesome. But God's going to rebuild. And out of that rebuilding then, as a church... We won't be on empty. Some of us will be. But as a church, out of our brokenness, out of our humility to say we're sinners, then that's the starting point where we start to say we have the energy, we have the passion, we have the resources to reach this city, to reach our towns in whatever ways we can because we're here for you and we love you. That's rhythm. But for now, this week, in the coming weeks, as a church... I think it's a time to heal. It is. We're going to get to know you. So for Liz and I, that's... But for some of you, it's a time to heal. What does that look like? Just a time to heal, to just catch our breath, to say, who is this guy? Or what's going on? But it's a time to heal. It's a time to pray. For those of you who are discerning or intercessors, is Krista here? Krista said she'd be here. Oh, got the new baby. She's an intercessor, prayer warrior. We need you who are prayer. I don't use the term prayer warrior because you're like, what does that mean? Are you out there? Um, just means someone who prays a lot. I need you praying right now for rhythm. Man, Lord, do a healing work here. Do a healing work. The people not here, Lord, do a healing work. Do a healing work, Lord. All right, give me two minutes, three minutes to end practically because for me, I just, I need concrete.
like maybe this was too big picture for you. You're checking out our church. You're like, why do they show maps? I'm never coming back again. <laughs> so it's kind of big picture, history. So let's, let's make it real. What does it look like this week? Just a couple things practically. We'll put it up on the screen. If you're saying, I'm not broken. I'm not really feeling broken. I'm doing great. To you, I'd say, man, that is awesome. We need you, you know, with that sort of energy for others so you can be praying praying for others and, and praying for our church and then fill in the blank. And you're saying, I don't like fill in the blank. I just want homework. No, we're all different. So it may be like this morning where I'm trying to give someone a hug because man is a message and he, and, and mental health and we're, uh, me too. So there's that hug to enter into that brokenness. Maybe it's a lunch date, a coffee date, an email, a phone call where you can say, this is my way of just, you know, you, you, it's not just, I'm going to serve them. No, enter into the brokenness how can you do that this week a co-worker a friend a family member so that's why i said fill in the blank that's your homework you'll figure it out god will give you the strength his spirit will work through you tap you on the heart and then you go oh, that was my fill in the blank and i just did it enter into that brokenness God is going to work through Rhythm Church because story after story after story after story after story of what Jesus has done in our lives and now we get to do that for others. Fill in the blank. And then secondly, if you'd say, yep, I'm barely holding it together this morning. Uh, uh, how am I paying the bills? Will the kids drive me nuts? First week back of school, we're uh, da, 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 right? And you're, you're just, my head is not above water and you'd say, I'm just, whatever it may be for you, you don't feel like serving. And you're just like, I can't enter into someone's brokenness. Good grief, I just have enough on my own plate. To you, I would say, okay, pray. Pray. And whatever prayer looks like, just, that could be a prayer of help. Get me through today. Mourn. If you're not processing your emotions with God and someone else, you're just stifling it. Guys, you need to hear me say that. It is not healthy to just stiff up or lip, I've got this, and then you wonder why you burnt out like 12 months later. You Like, yes, process it with God, with someone else. It's not weak, touchy-feely sort of stuff. Like, these are full of real emotions here where we say, God, I've had enough, and you need to process that with him or mourn or weep, and then look to Jesus. If you're feeling broken, look to Jesus, look to him. He's got you, he loves you. And if we can pray for you, if we can minister to you, I'll pray with you after church. Krista, definitely, you'll pray with people after church, right? Marlon, you'll pray with people. You and Terry will pray with people after church. If you're feeling broken, don't leave here and feel like, I wanted someone to pray for me and I left. We'll pray for you. Find, find that healing. You may find deliverance today where you're just like, I left here with joy. That's the most awesome thing, by the way. Some of you know that feeling. I've had that feeling where it's like, down here and then just Jesus does a work oh my goodness the light's back and he can do that sometimes it takes a while so you either got fill in the blank homework or you got pray and seek Jesus homework right Father God man oh man we just thank you that you are so awesome and holy and good and we always look to you I pray for those that may be struggling this morning. There are those here that may not even be Christian and they're just wondering, what's this all about? I pray your spirit that is present here would be made real to them in their hearts. No argument I could give them could convince them of something probably, but in their heart, they feel you right now and you're peaceful loving, restoring presence that they cannot deny, that you are real, that you love them. Holy Spirit, fill this place, fill their hearts. Those that are just barely making it through the week, give them joy or give them strength, give them patience. You see them, they're not alone. And I pray for Rhythm Church. Pray for healing here, restoration.
that we as a church would seek you together, would seek your heart, would say, Holy Spirit, where are you leading us? It's not what all the other churches are doing around. What are you doing that's unique to us, to our church? We want to seek your heart and say, what does that look like? To be a church that's formed each week, our kids, our teenagers, to be more like you, to be more like Jesus Christ to those around us. Help us. And now as we go into this time of worship, we just surrender to you. We just look to you. Just say you are awesome and holy. Thank you that you love us so much. In Jesus' name, amen.